During the war, it was used as a tractor. It had a character that appealed to people. It's got an awful lot of power, makes a disproportionately loud amount of noise. Get on the motorway on a day like this, I've even been known to do 50. You don't so much park it, I think you abandon it. I've driven everywhere in this. It just is a fantastic car. Fiat began in the summer of 1899 when in, a, in the form of a meeting between three army officers, uh, Giovanni Agnelli, Count Roberto Biscaretti di Rofia and Count Bricarasio. And they were interested in things mechanical, but they were not engineers. So sensibly, they didn't attempt to design and build a car themselves. They took over the Cerano company that made bicycles and a small three and a half horsepower light car, which they modified, they changed it from belt drive to chain drive, and this became the first ever Fiat. Fiat is an acronym. It was originally decided to call the company the Italian Automobile Factory, Fabrica Italiana Automobili, or FIA. This had a rather unconvincing sound to it, so they decided to add the word Torinese to it, for Turin, which made Fiat. The problem with this is that the Vatican took offence because a fiat was and is a papal decree and they thought this was lese majeste. In fact, in the end, it, fiat it became and fiat it's remained to this day. They started almost from the very beginning to produce a very wide range. There was no reason why any Italian buyer couldn't find a Fiat to suit them. The other thing about Fiat is that apart from the home market, which was obviously all important to them, they went for export from a very early stage. Two years after starting, the first Fiats were sold for export. Fiat were clearly doing very well in the years up to the First World War. And in fact, they went on doing well right through that war. Their cars were ideal army staff cars, and their trucks were ideal for army vehicles. By the end of the First World War, Fiat was still doing well, but in common with everyone else in the car industry, they faced a totally different market. The market had expanded beyond anything that had been predicted before the war. So what was needed was mass production. And Fiat were quick off the mark. By 1919, they had a completely new car design, the Tipo 501, which is a very modern design, four-cylinder engine, detachable cylinder head, full electrics, and possibly the first self-starter ever fitted to a production car. It's a Fiat 501 with a special body made by Mitchell of Nottingham for a chap who used to live at Southall near Nottingham. It's a lot larger than the normal body because from what I can find out he was about six feet four. In fact when I drive it any distance I have to have a rolled up blanket behind me because it's rather difficult leaning forward to try and hit the clutch or the uh, brake particularly. During the war, it was used as a tractor. God knows how many miles it must have done. And then, when the radiator finally burst, they discarded it, fixed it up with a large galvanised iron tank, and they used it to drive a saw by tying one back wheel to the chassis with the rope, jacked the other back wheel up, took the wing off and the tyre, and drove a saw. I, I suppose they'd use the top gear for twigs and bottom gear for logs, you see. And uh, then, finally, the, the, the starting handle uh, gave up the ghost, worn out, and so they stopped using it and shoved it in the, uh, the old chicken run, you see. The farmer was only too pleased to get rid of it. You didn't pay for things that You were looked upon, shall I say, as a scavenger, uh, and they were only too pleased to unload the stuff onto you, you see. Well, I eventually found all the parts. In fact, we used to spend our weekends all over the country, various... Uh, scrapyards. In 1961, I was invited over to the Nottingham Goose Fair to lead a parade of vintage cars. And of course, there's a photograph appeared eventually in the Nottingham Union Post. Well, about a month later, I got a phone call from a lady who said, you don't know me, but I know your car. I said, really, madam? She said, yes, yes, I spent my honeymoon in it. It was my husband's first car, but I was, he was the second owner of it. And so I took it over to see her, you see. Well, the first thing she saw, said to me, Now, young man, 
Those wheels should not be yellow. They were red when we had it. So, of course, you see the wheels are now red. Oh, well, it's very nice to drive, easy. You've got an elbow rest on the upholstery, and you put your elbow there, you just drop your hand and it hits the steering wheel. And you just drive along, you can set the throttle, and you just go along there steering away. It was known as the new high-speed Fiat engine. It does it somewhere in about 2,500 revs, which was quite a lot in those days. It's one and a half litres side valve of course. It's got an automatic choke, believe it or not. An electric automatic choke. Now there are not very many cars that have had those. And it cruises at 45. Get on the motorway on a day like this and I've even been known to do 50. I never imagined that when I found this wreck that it would take me to the various places on the continent as it has done. And you know what English people are like driving abroad, they won't take the car if they're can help it and to think that I drive a car that age over to Italy and I always dressed like this by the way all to collar and tie. I'm known as a gentilhomme. <laughs> it's a fact. There they are all togged up in their lightweight suits and open neck shirts but I don't just wear it. See? Besides you've got to keep up the image you know. After all we're English. <laughs> the 501 success was so marked that its rivals began to copy it, and it's an open secret that Herbert Austin's Austin 12 was a crib of the Tipo 501. The early post-war cars that Fiat made carried them through into the years of the Depression that proved the demise of so many well-established and apparently thriving car companies. In Fiat's case, it's hardly seemed to cause a ruffle in the company's prosperity, because by then they were making so many other things as well. Railway locomotives, railway rolling stock, fighter aircraft and ships. And this was a time, remember, when Mussolini's regime in Italy was pursuing a very, very energetic and lucrative rearmament programme, which Fiat was doing very well out of. Where Fiat were clever is that they moved down market to the small car market, which was opening up as people were less wealthy, less able to afford the existing cars. And the car which most people will remember and associate with Fiat in this period is the Topolino. I think the measure of a popular car is when it gets a name. This particular car is known as the Topolino Little Mouse, or Mickey Mouse in, in Italy. The Volkswagen Beetle is known as the Beetle. Volkswagen didn't give it that name, no individual gave it that name. And in Sri Lanka, the little Fiat 500, the little Topolino, is known as the Bug Fiat. And I have actually seen one painted red with black spots, which would really look the part. It's 569 cc's, and it develops an enormous 13 brake horsepower. It's under the old RAC rating was 6.7 horsepower, which meant that when you came to tax the car when I was a young man, it was only 12 pounds instead of 15, so it had a great benefit. The, the Topolino was designed in response to a competition held at the Fiat Works in Turin. They wanted to bring out a, a small family car that could be afforded by even the peasants at that time. It came down to an aero engine designer, Dante Giacosa, who actually came up with the design for this little car. He decided against having a front wheel drive, two cylinder air cooled engine, and he went for a standard four cylinder engine, water cooled, side valve, prop shaft to the back axle. In other words, a, a big car in miniature, but one that had to be made to a price. This particular one in 1938 sold for £120 on the road, but if you wanted a rear wheel cover or bumpers, they were 30 shillings extra. As soon as I started to drive it, I fell completely in love with it. It's so small, it's very economical, 
and very willing. Unlike most cars of that period, this particular one, as you can see, has a bit of shape about it. It has a bit of streamlining about it, whereas the Morris 8s and Austin 7s of the period were very box-like structures. This one is something different. The bonnet slopes down so you get a beautiful view of the road from it, no bonnet in the way, and it cruises along very happily at 40-45 miles an hour, and it does 50 miles to the gallon, so for a young man with a young family, it was the ideal car. And this particular model, this one, I bought in 1980 in boxes. It took me three years to restore it, and the first showed it at Bromley Pageant of Motoring in 1983, June. And I've driven everywhere in this. It just is a fantastic car. The Topolino carried on in production in its basically pre-war form up to 1948. Even then, what happened was not the dropping of the model, but its replacement by a restyled version called the Fiat 500C. This stayed in production until 1957, and then they changed their philosophy completely and went back to rear-engine cars. The Fiat 500 that was introduced in 1957 went on from strength to strength as the Fiat 500 that most people remember from the 60s and 70s. It appealed to people because it was chic, because it was Italian, and because once again, although it was very small, very compact and very economical, it was a real car. It could be driven enthusiastically, it could be driven quickly within the limits of its performance, and people loved it. It had a, a character that appealed to people, which is very difficult to sum up, but is quite unmistakable. The success of the Fiat 500 meant that Fiat's next step was to produce a larger engine version uh, called the Fiat 600 and it was worked upon by specialists like Carlo Abbas to produce a very, very potent rally car. This is basically a Fiat 600D uh, from 1966 which was transformed into a Fiat R bar 1000 Berlina Corsa, which means racing saloon. It's a little car, it's got an awful lot of power, makes a disproportionately loud amount of noise, but it has lots of sophistication, which is not immediately apparent. So I know it's got a five-speed gearbox and a limited slip diff, and it's got double wishbone front suspension, so-called pendolari front suspension in Italian. Lots of things that you you are not immediately obvious. So the character is, in the first place, hidden, but it's extremely quick. It's a real, full-blooded Italian racing car in sheep's clothing. I saw an advert one day for a Lotus engine Fiat 600, which I thought was a wonderful idea. So I rang the bank and said, I want to buy this small car. And then he said, said, what sort of small car? I said, Fiat 600. He said, very sensible. And he lent me the money. You know, because I, I did leave out the detail that it had a 1600 engine hanging out of the back and it was purely for sprinting and hill climbing and subsequently circuit racing. <music> Carlo Arbath was a man who wanted to go motor racing and he hit upon the idea of taking a very mundane car, i.e. the Fiat 600, which was produced to basically move the masses and transform it to whatever degree the customer wanted. But he really did extract very, very good performance from what was, at the end of the day, real Van Ordinaire. The rear end, uh, which you will see is propped up, started in, in the early 60s uh, with a view to getting rid of some heat, and it was propped up a few inches. And uh, they discovered by chance the car actually went a bit faster. Uh, this is an aerodynamic issue. So by 64, the, the thing was horizontal and is apparently worth six or seven kilometers an hour in top speed. It actually, with this type of engine, can't be closed anyhow. <laughs> yeah. 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 
Our baths were terribly expensive. I remember in the price list, I can tell you that in 1963, a twin cam one litre was 3,999 quid. An E-Type was 2,000. A full-blown racing version, this by the end of the decade, was, was over 10,000 pounds which was huge amounts of money. You might expect Fiat 5 and 600 material to be full of children, dogs, the paraphernalia of family life. In fact, that's not the case. The people in these are very chic, well-dressed adults. Ladies in cocktail dresses peer through the roofs of Fiat 500s. Four adults dressed in suits pile into a car that is obviously ridiculously small. The Fiat 600 was produced at 633 cc's with water-cooled engine and created a platform for other vehicles like the Fiat 600 Multipla, which was the taxi version. We call them MPVs today and all sorts of manufacturers would tell you how wonderful they've invented this new idea. Well, it's, it's rubbish because Fiat produced it back in the late 50s uh, on the Fiat 600 chassis and you could move seven people about. It's called the Fiat 600 Multipla, was the first MPV. They should make more of it. They invented it. Fiat had found that the, there were more and more lucrative pickings to be made at the smaller end of the car market. But they did have one or two flirtations with the larger end, which probably reached their zenith in the 60s with a Fiat 2300. This was a large, boxy saloon, but it provided the basis for one of the most elegant and desirable Fiats of the, the entire company's history. This was the Fiat 2300S. What you're looking at here was bodied by Mr. Gear and Carlo Arbaf waved his magic wand over the engine. I like to think that what you're looking at now is probably the best example in the UK. Back in the late 60s, the early 70s, I was, I was working in the Lebanon. Um, my daughter was born out there and my daughter's godfather actually owned this car ever since he bought it and I rode in it. I always wanted it. Bill decided he wanted to buy what was then the new Alfa Romeo 2000 GTV. I said, fine, what are you going to do this one? He said, sell it. I said, how much do you want for it? He said, I'll take a thousand. I said, done. When the 2300 Coupe first appeared, it wasn't long before people started calling it the poor man's Ferrari. And I'm sure Fiat can't have been too disappointed with that description because it was a great deal cheaper than a Ferrari, it looked beautiful, it had plenty of performance, and it was rather understated. It appealed to people with money, not on a Ferrari scale, but people who wanted something different. We got back into this country in 77. We used it then until 1979 um, as a family car, basically. And then in 1979, I took her off the road and said, one of these days, I'm gonna get round to rebuilding it. Three house moves later, and going through the list of priorities that married men are obliged to go through, um, it took me until 1991 to actually start the rebuild. Because the car had seen very, very little in English winters, it hadn't suffered the traditional fate of Italian cars of the 60s, it hadn't rusted to pieces. So one of the first jobs we did was to spend a year underneath, making sure that everything was solid, stripping it down to bare metal underneath and zinking it. Everything is zinc painted, because if you're going to do it, then you must do it right. The original paint put on by gear was acrylic paint. That didn't weather very well in the Middle East because of the hot temperatures, accompanied with cold car washes, and the paint actually crazed like crazy paving. No matter how many times you painted it, that crazy paving came through. So the only answer at the end of the day was to strip her right down to bare metal and start again. The people I found to do it were absolutely superb, real craftsmen, 
the only original part of the colour left on the car was on the glove box. And they took the glove box off and they matched and mixed the paint to match the glove box. And when it came back, you couldn't tell the difference between the two. They were spot on, superb. It's quite funny when you talk old cars and you say, oh, I've restored an old car, and they say, what is it? And you say, a fear, and you can see the look on their face. This man must be mad. <laughs> if you then show them the car and get them in it, then they understand. She's basically built for long distance autobahn driving. She will cruise all day at 100 mile an hour without any hiccup at all. Uh, you've even got a hand throttle. You can take your feet off the pedals if you wish and just sort of relax. Driving around town is not fun, to put it simply. You're trying to tote a ton and a third thereabouts, plus passengers if you've got any, with no power steering. Um, parking it in confined spaces, you don't so much park it, I think you abandon it. It was a success, but a small success. It couldn't compete in commercial terms. It simply extended the Fiat representation into a market that they were soon to make their own by a much closer involvement with Ferrari themselves. In 1967, Fiat produced the Fiat Dino. Fiat's progressively closer relationship with Ferrari, in fact, ended in them taking over completely. Although Fiat has taken over most of the rest of the Italian car industry, it's never indulged in badge engineering. It's never absorbed those companies so completely that they lose their identity. Lancia is produced under Fiat ownership. Alfa Romeo is produced under Fiat ownership. Still remain recognisably different. I think with the Fiat today, you have a wonderful range of vehicles. And I'm not being paid to say this by Fiat. And one of the things they identified was a need for a really small car. We have far too many cars on our roads, they take up too much room, they use up too much fuel. People who live in big cities don't want big cars, there's nowhere to park them. So they relaunched the 500 concept in the Cinquecento. And okay, it has a 900 or even larger engine, but it is a very small car. It has a personality, it's a cheeky looking car, it's good fun, it's environmentally friendly, it's good value for money inexpensive to buy, does exactly what the original 500 and 600 set out to do. The one thing the Fiat story lacks is drama. There aren't any cliffhanging moments because Fiat found a successful formula right at the beginning and carried on prospering on that formula ever since. There is a saying about Fiat that most people know that the French government owns Renault. Nobody knows who owns VW, but everyone knows that Fiat owns Italy. 